Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. No one knows what awaits him or her behind the next turn of fate. We naively plan our lives, dreaming that we will enter a prestigious university, and after graduation, we will get a high-paying job. Later, we will meet a worthy life partner, create a strong family with him, provide our children with a better future, and die in a deep old age in the circle of relatives and friends. This is probably everyone's dream. The success of some only spurs us on, gives us an incentive to live better. But what if things go differently than we expected? As we grow up, we take off our rose-colored glasses, and the clod of adult problems grows every year. It is only how we deal with it that shapes us as a person. From Angela Stalt's memoir on her website, I was born in Bangkok, Thailand, into a military family. My parents raised me with love and respect. I was disciplined but never abused by them. The woman was born in 1972. At the time of the events, she was just over 40 years old. Due to her father's work, the family often had to move around without staying in one place for long periods of time. As soon as the girl got used to the new school and had time to make friends, another move was planned. Angela lived in constant worry and anxiety. The woman's poor health also contributed to her hardships. Angela had been diagnosed with a thyroid disease, for which she had to take maintenance medication for the rest of her life. The disease depressed her mental and emotional state. However, Angela wanted to live and love like all other people. Gradually, her family settled in Georgia. Angela went to high school, where she still had difficulty adjusting. To fit in, she began to socialize with the first company that accepted her. Unfortunately, they were kids from dysfunctional families. There, she met a guy who was three years older than Angela and was already in his first year of college. After a year of studying, Angela made the decision to drop out of school and live with a young man. When I was 15 years old and living in Georgia, I married a very abusive man who kept me away from my parents. In addition to being treated like a prisoner, I was regularly punched and choked. Twice, as I recall, he used CPR to bring me to consciousness after choking me. I had broken ribs, a dislocated jaw, numerous bruises, my voice box was damaged, and my windpipe was crushed. After five years of torment, I found a way to escape from him. At that time, I was diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorder, and depression. I started taking antidepressants. After the breakup, Angela married a second time fairly quickly. Once again, she found herself trapped with another dominant man. At that point, she was in her early 20s. In 1996, a son was born to the couple, and all would have been nothing, except that the man was not known for his mild temper and also beat the young woman. This exacerbated my symptoms of PTSD, anxiety disorder, and depression. At this time, I started taking a highly addictive drug, Angela recalls. The former lovers eventually broke up and the baby's father disappeared. Angela was left alone with the baby in her arms. Since she never finished school, Angela had few jobs and no profession, and having a baby in her arms made it difficult to find a job. All she could think of in this situation was to find a man to take responsibility for both of them. Around the age of 25, she remarried. From her third marriage, two more children were born, a boy and a girl. Despite her health condition and unstable psyche, the woman cherished her family and brought up her children. However, time was ruthless, and for this marriage. In 2011, the man left the family. Later, Angela also claimed that her former spouse was no different from the previous ones. He was a manipulator and a toxic man. According to her, this is what caused the breakup. Now Angela was left alone with three children. One thing was good. The older children could already provide for themselves, but Angela had no other stable income except for social payments from the state. She had enough for a modest life, but she wanted to live better. Money decides everything. Probably everyone has heard this expression many times. They are an indicator of prosperity and wealth of a person. They serve as a kind of criterion of his mental abilities, luck, and judgment. However, not everyone knows how to earn them. Some are simply not given. Someone prefers to sit and do nothing while waiting for receipts from outside. Someone and does something, even trying, but gets a little. 
and maybe wrongly disposing of them. There is another category of people who love money and wait for it, the so-called lovers of easy money. But sooner or later, there comes a moment when you have to pay the bills. In 2007, Angela and her family moved to Florida, a suburb of Daytona Beach, and settled near a young couple with children. They turned out to be James Schaefer and Candy Medina. The families quickly became friends with each other. The young people supported Angela in difficult times and often visited each other. On April 2nd, 2013, James said goodbye to Candy as he was going to his next appointment. She was sleeping sweetly in her bed with her children. That night, Candy saw her lover for the last time. Missing persons flyers described James as being about 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing about 275 pounds. He had brown eyes, brown hair. Distinguishing features included several tattoos, one that read Gringo on his neck, a Metallica skull on his right calf, and NCC on his right forearm. The last time he was seen, he was wearing work clothes that consisted of a black shirt, black pants, and black shoes, the standard dress code for a limousine driver. James Schaefer was born in 1976 and grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, USA. He had a fairly large and close-knit family. He grew up together with his brother and sister, whose names were Christian and Andrew. The guy was fond of sports since childhood, highlighting baseball the most. After graduating from high school, together with his girlfriend, Candy, went in search of a better life in Florida. The couple was in a relationship for a long time, had four children. There was a relaxed atmosphere in the family. Each member of the family was loved. The main financial burden fell on the head of the family, James. Therefore, the guy got a job that brought a good income. The local company was engaged in the service of festive events, as well as private transportation of wealthy clients. The firm provided limousines and other expensive cars for rent. James got along with his colleagues, was polite and tactful with customers, and in good standing with the management. Time passed. It would seem that having a decent income, the financial well-being of the family should only grow. But instead, for several months in a row, the couple owed rent on the house. They even had their water turned off. The landlords were threatening to evict James and Candy soon. This kept James on his toes, looking for ways to stay off the streets. He had to do something about it. On that unfortunate night, James left his home to take a company-provided automobile. The man was to drive a group of people from Kissimmee, Florida, to Tampa, and then back. The drive was to take no more than two hours. James arrived at work around 3 a.m., picked up the vehicle and left to complete the assignment, but never returned home. Candy became worried as a lot of time had passed and James never made contact. Later, strange messages started coming from him saying that he needed to disappear for a period of time. The poor woman didn't understand anything. Candy began calling family and friends in the hope of finding out where James was and what had happened to him. And on April 4th, the father of the missing man decided to contact the police to report his son's disappearance. On April 21st, 2013, the sheriff's office received a call from a woman who said she knew someone who might be involved in James's death. She claimed that James Schaefer was not missing or a runaway. He was murdered. The witness blamed it on her own sister. The woman said her relative had attacked the man and now she was going to kill him. Allegedly, at a family meeting, her sister confessed to everyone about killing her best friend under the influence of illegal substances. The caller was then forced to contact the police as she was worried about her demented sister's children. After James's father reported James to the police, the detectives immediately began their investigation. First, they decided to talk to Candy, Perhaps she knew something about her loved one's disappearance or had been causing wariness lately. Candy reported that her husband had gone to work and nothing in his behavior seemed suspicious to her, except perhaps the messages that came from James in messengers after his disappearance. It later turned out that several other people in the family's inner circle had received similar texts. This information required investigation. The management of the company where James worked explained that the worker was indeed listed as one of the best employees, and such a sudden disappearance was not like him. They helped detectives clarify the time and reconstruct some of the events of that day. James arrived at work to pick up his car, got it ready to leave, and left around 4 a.m. However, the police still managed to find out something interesting. 
Employees of the firm said that shortly before his disappearance, James complained about financial problems and asked to borrow money. It is quite possible that this could be the reason for his disappearance. The man could have left the city to disappear from unfulfilled obligations and creditors. It was established that James had a gambling addiction. This explained his financial problems and utility and rent arrears. Detectives took this fact as a primary basis, so they continued to contact family relatives and friends. That's how police officers found themselves on the doorstep of James and Candy's friend and neighbor, Angela Stold. Angela greeted the police officers calmly, telling them that she was saddened by the disappearance of James, who was indeed her friend. He often stopped by her place after his shift for a drink, a heart-to-heart -heart chat, and to relax. They had purely platonic feelings for each other. When Angela was having financial problems, she approached James, asking for help, to which he offered to let her do his personal bookkeeping. When asked why his wife wasn't doing it, Angela replied that there was nothing strange about it. Thus, they helped each other. She would get a small reward for the work she did, and he would get his affairs in order. Initially, everything was fine, but at one point he started having financial problems. He wanted to get social support from the state. That's why he decided to involve Angela. So their friendly relationship turned into a dependent relationship on each other. After communicating with Angela, the police officers could not get away from the idea that there was something suspicious about Angela having access to James's accounts. Several transactions that had been made after the man's disappearance raised questions, and their meetings in the mornings after work raised some doubts about the fidelity of the missing man. So the police decided to take a closer look at the family friend. Angela seemed sincere, relaxed. There was no particular reason not to believe her after all. People often ask someone close to them to do the bookkeeping or hire specialists, so Stolt was ruled out as a suspect. Once established, it seemed obvious that James's flight was due to financial problems or something similar. There was money involved in the case. Investigators went to Angela's house again, but this time they decided to do more than just talk outside the house. They also asked to see her home. But what appeared before their eyes threw the representatives of law enforcement agencies into confusion. All the rooms were littered with garbage. Dirty plates with leftovers were everywhere. The leftovers were spoiled, and it all stank. In short, it was unsanitary. It was clear that Angela had some kind of mental problems. However, they did not find James here. This is how Angela tells it. Because of my illness and injuries, I have not been able to properly clean or maintain my house for a long time. The police asked Angela to take part in the formal interrogation, which would be audio recorded. She repeated everything she had said earlier. She also said that her buddy was not addicted to substances, but was an occasional user, with some prescription drugs involved. For James, she said, it was an opportunity to relax on the weekends. Angela also said that the last time she saw the man was after he was reported missing. He came to her home and asked for money, to which she replied that she would not give him a dollar. The response angered the man, however, he left her home. The police also asked Angela to make a call to James, to explain the situation with the bills, to inform him that there is a big overspend, and that it could turn into something bad, to which she refused, citing the fact that he was no longer in contact with her. Angela also told about the problems at James' work, that someone from the staff threatened him, asking him to return a debt, so the detective's interest shifted to James's co-workers and his boss. A sudden call on April 21, 2013, made adjustments to the investigation of the case. The information could not be ignored. Once again, the detectives went to Angela Stolt, except that there was no trace left of the calm and balanced woman. They were met on the doorstep by a woman who clearly hadn't looked after herself in days. Her hair was sloppy. She seemed to be out of sorts. Her behavior was also inadequate, which was the reason she was deemed dangerous, both to herself and to society. On this basis, Angela was taken into custody, and later she was sent to a psychiatric hospital for 72 hours for the necessary evaluation. Before she was placed in the hospital, she spent some time under arrest at the local police department, so it was established that on April 3, 2013, she picked up James Schaefer from work after completing an order. James was alarmed. He needed to fix the situation or his family would be evicted from the house. 
Either he and his children would be left on the street, or they would have to move back in with their parents, which wasn't an option either. In addition, he did not want to admit to himself and his family that his difficult financial situation was caused by gambling. He was so eager to win back what he had lost. But luck had turned away from James, and there was no one else to turn to at work. It was embarrassing in front of his co-workers. He'd always repaid his debts before, but now things were going wrong. Maybe Angela will help out, and if not, I'll ask her father to help. He helped me out once before, and I paid him back all my debts on time, James pondered. Angela suggested they come in and have a glass of a mixture of peach schnapps and vodka. And for more peace of mind, let's add something else. It'll help you relax, Angela suggested. James was fine with the drug, which, by the way, was only available by prescription. He even crushed the pills himself so that they would dissolve faster and enhance the effect of the alcohol. After drinking a glass, James asked his friend if her father could lend him an amount between $2,000 and $4,000. James knew that his friend's father was seriously ill and literally on the verge of death. Therefore, he himself needed money for treatment, but his situation was desperate. How can he ask such a thing, especially now? He already owes me money. I can barely make ends meet. Angela was indignant, but she didn't let on. You'll have to ask your father about that, Angela replied. James then offered to give her a ride to her parents' house so that she wouldn't have to stall and find out as soon as possible. Hope for a speedy resolution to the trouble settled in his heart. Around 5 a.m., they set out on the road. Since it was still early, Angela's father was asleep, and the woman had changed her mind about going to him, she suggested stopping the car near the cemetery located in Dayton. No one expected what happened afterward. At least that's what Angela told the police. I took James to my favorite place in Dayton, which turned out to be the cemetery, to talk to him alone. I knew he would scream, and I didn't want my kids to be abused anymore. They were being terrorized by their father, and they didn't need any more of that. So when we parked... We turned around in our seats facing each other with our backs against the doors, Angela recalled. She told James that she would not borrow money for him from her father, much less force him to take out loans for that purpose, and that she would stop doing his bookkeeping after they sorted out the bills and social security payments. Maul, enough of him setting her up. Jason became enraged, started screaming and grabbed her by the throat. He screamed, I'm going to kill you. You can't do that. It's my money. I grabbed my cell phone that was on the console. He threw it into the back seat of my car, continuing his tirade. Angela describes his condition. According to her, he threatened that he would kill her children as well. Stolt took these threats seriously. To defend herself, she grabbed the first thing she could get her hands on from the trunk. That tool turned out to be an ice axe, which she carried with her as camping and hiking equipment. Angela struck James and hit him in the eye, but he wasn't dead. He was completely disoriented. James began to scream. Angela then took a PVC cord that she used on hikes to climb trees. Wrapping the cord around her roommate's throat, she rested her feet on the back of the driver's seat and began pulling hard on his neck. After a while, the man stopped moving. Angela pulled the ice pick out of the victim's right eye. When asked by the police about where in the car such equipment came from, the neighbor explained that she and her family were going to go camping in the next month. All these gadgets were necessary for her, and she was just storing them in the car. Everyone at Angela's interrogation was horrified. In fact, James hadn't asked for anything supernatural. She could have refused him and stopped communicating with him further. Moreover, they believed that there might not have been any threats from James at all, and that Angela's mental state had played a cruel joke on her. A medical examination later showed that Angela was aware of her own actions during the incident. The police also did not rule out that the crime could have been planned in advance. Firstly, the strange accessories in the car were questionable. Secondly, why leave the house to just talk when it could have been done in front of witnesses? To which Angela also had an answer. I knew he had some violent tendencies in the past, but he had never been violent towards me before. If I thought he was going to use physical force, I wouldn't have taken him to a place where I was in danger. I would have taken him to some public place. He almost killed me. Things could have easily gone differently, and I wouldn't have put myself in that situation. When it was over, Angela was very frightened. 
According to her, she was in shock, but that didn't stop her from stabbing the other eye again to make sure James was dead. But the gruesome story didn't end there. To avoid getting blood splattered on her car, she wrapped the dead man in a plastic bag. When he finally let go of me, I realized he was dead, got out of the car, and I threw up. It took quite a while before I could breathe, and then I was faced with a new kind of horror. I was on autopilot, my mind strangely shut down, and I just started doing something. I went back to the car to get my cell phone to call the police, but I couldn't find it. So I covered it up as best I could and drove to the police station. As I drove down Fort Smith Boulevard, I panicked, the thoughts going through my head telling me that the police would never believe me. My life was over. I would lose my children. I kept looking at him and the fear kept building. Anyway, with James' corpse, Angela arrived home. After that, she dragged the body to the shed. Here, taking a hacksaw, she began to cut it into pieces. The severed body fragments, Angela decided to put them into pots and pans, oiling them. A remarkable fact is that when Angela first spoke to the police about James's disappearance, his body parts were just being boiled in pots and pans. However, this went unnoticed as the investigators did not enter the house that time. When police first entered Angela's home, Stolt had already completely dismembered the body. She packed the individual parts into garbage bags and scattered them in different parts of the city. Some sources say that she was assisted in this by her older children, whom she told that she had accidentally hit a deer on the road. At the same time, she strictly forbade them to enter the shed so that they would not see the evidence of the crime. Following this confession, Angela was arrested for second-degree murder. Police officers actively searched for James's posture. Out of 206 bones, they were only able to locate 56. James Schaefer was buried in a closed casket. None of his relatives could bid him a proper farewell. Afterwards, the prosecutor's office upgraded the crime to first-degree murder because many facts pointed to a premeditated act. In addition, Angela tried to get rid of the body, covering her tracks, which wanted to confuse the investigation. Investigators believed that the woman's plan was well thought out and also included misinformation of James's relatives. For this purpose, she used his cell phone, from which she wrote to his wife and family, as well as some friends. On December 2nd, 2014, Angela Stolt went on trial. The woman immediately confessed to the murder, but insisted that she did it as a result of self-defense. The prosecutor's office tried to refute her words, as the main motive was considered to be money. Angela had been in financial trouble for most of her life, making her fearful that James would cheat and use her. That morning, when they had been drinking with James, the woman had clearly had too much to drink. Her anger at him, at life, and at the injustice of the men around her spilled out into an assault. On December 5, 2014, the jury retired to deliberate on the verdict. After deliberating, they unanimously found Angela guilty of first-degree murder as well as abuse of the body, tampering with evidence. As a result, she was sentenced to life in prison without parole. What was going on in Angela's head is hard to imagine. A sick mind a sick body, a tortured soul. However, apparently Angela still doesn't realize what she has done. She didn't just take the life of a man she considered her best friend. She brutalized him without giving him a single chance for salvation. And after all, like a butcher butchering a carcass, she dismembered James and boiled him in a pot. Money had ruined more than one friendship, but to do it this way, you'd better stay away from friends like that. Thanks for watching guys, that was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel, there are many shocking stories ahead.